So what I'd like to do now is to kind of walk you through the actual assignment and the scaffolding of the project. 
uh, in the hopes that you might be able to kind of adapt it for your own classroom uses or those of you in libraries when you're working with faculty to say, hey, here's a model you might like to look at. Um, so the, uh, each student to begin the assignment was assigned one of these authors and then was asked to research and compile enough information to complete either a Wikipedia article or a short textual biography that would be added to the Diamond Science website. Each student was given all of the information that Susan Altieri had already compiled as a starting point, which for some lucky students included lifespan dates, family information, known pen names, or nation of origin. For some of the students, it literally was the author's name and the title of the book that, that she had published. And that's it. That's all she could find. Um, so then, with that information, uh, the students were, were given this assignment, but the assignment acknowledged from the outset that the chance of authoring one of those biographies might very well be impossible. Um, so from the very title of the assignment, it was important for the students to understand that the ultimate goal might be out of reach, as it was for the curator who does this professionally. Um, and therefore, the assignment was structured to help students learn good research practices, to engage with various digital learning communities, and to document their work with an eye towards process over final product. Um, and so the final project deliverable was then a research portfolio, which permitted students to mix and match at least three elements based on the information that they found. Uh, so students were aiming to complete one of the two public-facing biographies. But if they were unable to complete one, they could include an archived version of their Twitter research journal, a research narrative describing their research process, or archives of the correspondence that they had with experts. Uh, and so most of the students opted for different combinations depending on what they found. Um, so one popular combination was the Baldwin biography, a research narrative, and their MLA work second page. Some students didn't even find enough to do that. Uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. So from the very beginning, the assignment warned the students that their task might be impossible. As the instructor, knowing that the information that the students were looking for might be impossible to find given the age of the material, the limited digitization of those materials, and the historical lack of records on the exhibit from the Victorian age. Um, therefore, I had to structure the assignment so that the students could fulfill the required learning outcomes, or in the students' parlance, that they could get an A on the project, um, even without being able to complete one of those final biographies. So ultimately, the assignment sheet instructed that students should approach this project as a journey into the unknown. They should be prepared to make mistakes, get messy, uh, and potentially come up empty-handed. So we'll play on this puzzle from the Magic Toolbox there. Um, a large part of the project will include figuring out how to make failure and frustration productive, how to document a research process so that future researchers might benefit, and how to enjoy the research rabbit hole. So therefore, while this assignment offered students an opportunity to uncover and make meaning as researchers in, in their own right, it also functioned as an introduction to the process of, quote, real research, including the mental and emotional labor of failure when researching. Uh, so that's the main gist of the assignment, and I'll talk a little bit now about the two scaffolding assignments that supported the larger project. In an attempt to emphasize the concept of research over process, I asked students to keep a public-facing research journal using Twitter. So over the course of the month-long project, students were required to send at least 30 original tweets about their research process to the course hashtag 1102KidsEye and the assignment hashtag uh, RJ. Uh, they also were required to send 10 reply tweets to other people within that course hashtag. Students were encouraged to send their tweets about their ideas, successes, failures, frustrations, questions, search terms, and correspondence in real time as their research was unfolding. And so the informal nature of Twitter, along with the multimodal components, uh, such as images, links, and videos, allowed students to share a wider variety of information with peers and their public, regardless of character limits. Uh, as a result, this form of research journal also reported the ups and downs of the research process and made what's usually an invisible labor of research very tangible, very real, and very human. The students also wrote blog posts on the course blog uh, as a public-facing progress report. Uh, so this detailed the, progress, the work that they'd done so far about two weeks in. Um, it had them talk about their methodological approaches and their successes and failures at that midway point. Uh, so this scaffolding process served a couple of functions. First, it ensured that students had at least started their research project, 
second, it gave students who were less comfortable with the short form of Twitter an opportunity to gather their thoughts in a longer, more traditional format. And third, it opened an additional venue of feedback both for the instructor and for the students in the course. So many students pointed to these progress reports as a motivational jumping off point. Um, this is where many students admitted that they were just getting started. Um, or many other students admitted that they were really struggling. And so overall, this progress report helped open the floodgates in terms of peer-to-peer -peer interaction and so supportive collaboration. So moving from this assignment structure into the pedagogical goals, I want to talk about the four major goals I had for this project, followed by some of the major outcomes. Um, and so all of these four pedagogical goals worked together, um, but in talking through them, I hope to give you a sense of how you might use this kind of uh, project as a model for your own classrooms or your own archives. So the first pedagogical goal was content. Um, it was to have students engage with historical records and the rhetorical spaces of 18th and 19th century science, as I previously mentioned. So given that this course was taught at a technical institute that only began accepting women into classes in the 1950s, uh, and given the current social and political movements within the STEM field and the Me Too movement more broadly, this seemed especially important and relevant and one for the students to really engage with. Obviously, this is the content that would shift depending on the course and the content under discussion in your own classroom or library. Uh, the second goal was to help my students move beyond Google and to harness digital research technologies, including social media, to find information. So talk a little bit about how we use Twitter and WordPress, but a third form of digital networking included encouraging students to reach out to experts via email. Um, as an option for the final portfolio, the students were given um, the opportunity to include an archive of correspondence with librarians, curators, publishers, archivists, and other scholars. Uh, I gave students an in-class tutorial on how to write a polite, professional email asking for information or for research assistance. I also gave them a tutorial on how to write thank you notes. Um, this goal uh, seemed, this one seems the most applicable when adapting this assignment, this assignment for your own the third goal was to undermine the expectation that the professor already knows all the answers, which is kind of a scary thing to do sometimes as a professor. Um, but I really wanted to upend this idea that it's the student's job to rediscover what I have decided is the right answer. Um, so this assignment especially nullifies the concept explicated in Paolo Freire's banking model of education, um, and it's the part of the project that I think made the students most uncomfortable. In fact, they were totally, totally free. Um, so much so that this student in her blog post thought I was lying when I said, I don't know. Um, a lot of students really honestly thought that I was making up the idea that I didn't know which of these were going to be the easiest to research, that I didn't already know all the answers. Um, and so to undermine this kind of top-down banking model, this project further emphasized the concept of research and discovery as a process. Um, so both I and the Georgia Tech research librarians uh, reiterated that research students the research that students who are most likely to be engaged in as civil engineers, as computer science developers, as architects, are going to likely reflect the same kind of open-ended problem solving. These students are likely to find themselves in industries where they're asked to create a solution to a problem that has no correct answer, right? What is the correct answer to fixing climate change? We don't know. Um, and so the exposure to this kind of problem paired with the opportunity to conduct original research in a first-year composition class that for my tech students is a relatively low stakes environment for them, um, allowed students to embrace the challenge and to reorient themselves with a new way of thinking about research and about their own education. Uh, and so the fourth goal was an intimately tied to that third one in asking first year students to engage in difficult original research without the promise of results, the assignment actively set up many of these high performing students to fail. Um, and so in order to teach them how to fail, in order to have them cope, have them figure out how to handle that disappointment, that frustration, that idea of failure as a part of the process. Um, as many of you may have experienced in your own classrooms, students um, can often face frustration or difficulty in completing a project, and so they shut down, they give up, or they blame the instructor because you didn't tell me exactly what you wanted. Um, and so therefore, the structure of this assignment was built around the risk of failure as a regular part of original research, thereby emphasizing the need for good research habits, such as recording and documenting the steps of a research process, as well as creative problem solving in the face of setbacks, um, or what we eventually ended up turning in my class brick walls. 
Um, and so managing the risk of failure took the form of a five minute check-in at the beginning of each class period. Students were asked to discuss uh, what they had or hadn't found, what resources had been useful, and where they'd gone astray in the last couple of days. Early discussions were hesitant and limited, likely due in part to the fact that most of them hadn't started yet. Um, but after the blog progress report of the Florio Research and Tweeting that took place the day before that was due, uh, students became far more willing to admit running into these brick walls. Once the students were willing to share these failures with their peers, a focus on creative problem solving emerged. Uh, so some students began to hear back from archivists and librarians, and so more students were then willing to take that risk and reach out. Um, other students reported success with specific, specific digital resources available through our library, um, and so other students began to check the library databases as well. Um, in asking students to confront these brick walls and frustrations, then move on to new approaches, this project mimicked likely scenarios that researchers will face both in academia and industry. And so many of the threads in class repeatedly re revisited um, how to manage the frustration and failure from both a productivity standpoint and from an emotional one. Uh, and so the constant discussion and reinforcement of the assignments ups and downs in classes were also echoed in our digital interactions. So the RGA scaffolding component allowed for real-time feedback and coaching, um, both from myself and from the Georgia Tech subject librarian, Karen, Karen Beers, who just was on Twitter with my students all the time. She's awesome, um, above and beyond. So, uh, but we found ourselves responding frequently to students' tweets with encouragement, reassurance, um, the gift equivalent of a high five or a hug, right? Like, it's gonna be okay, you're gonna be all right. Um, so these tweets allowed us the opportunity to give feedback at the same level of irreverence, humor, and emotion as the students who are engaged in research, and to acknowledge and validate both the substantial work and the emotional labor of the research process that sometimes ends up with no results. So the outcomes of this project um, are where I'm going to wrap up, and then I'm more than happy to talk about this more um, during questions. And so the first outcome, I really upped my gift game, yeah, I also really upped my Twitter following. Um, and so if that's important to you, I, I would recommend the, this as a project. Um, but seriously, at the conclusion of the Possibly Impossible Research Project, students submitted 28 biographies for authors in the guide of science bibliography. A further nine authors now have these or some information gathered by the students that can be used to conduct further research. Out of the 50 authors assigned to the students by, at Georgia Tech, eight of them are the only have no new information. So that's really outstanding work by my students. Um, in addition, uh, the, the students contributed 11 either new Wikipedia articles on their authors or they edited and made significant improvements um, to some of those as well. So ultimately, the students ended up viewing with the Wikipedia article as the pinnacle of achievement for this project, um, owing in part to the high standards for verifiable sources for Wikipedia, um, and also because of the multimodal aspects of um, creating the coding um, and putting it up online and getting it through the editors on. Uh, we also had some unexpected discoveries, um, as with any, any original research, the potential for unexpected discoveries makes it especially exciting. Um, so a couple of lucky students uncovered scandalous content about their authors, um, especially that defied the stereotypical image of children's literature authors that they held in their mind, which was my favorite part as a children's book scholar. Um, so one student discovered evidence that her author had been sentenced to hard labor after being arrested for stealing. Um, another student found a newspaper article that accused her author of adultery. Um, and a third student uh, uncovered a lead that indicated that Mary Trimmer might have been a fake name used by American publishers to capitalize on the success of the British author Sarah Trimmer. What? Um, as students shared these discoveries via Twitter and during class discussion, their enthusiasm and surprise provided their classmates with motivation and entertainment. Um, regardless of how much information the students were able to locate, um, even the eight students who turned in portfolios that ended up saying no results reported feeling that they had learned a significant amount from the project. Uh, so a lot of them felt like they learned a lot about their author, about the topic that, they, that she wrote about, and about Victorian era society. Uh, but most reported a, a new appreciation for real research. Uh, an expanded understanding of the resources that were available to them through the Institute, and a growing appreciation for professional networking via digital platforms. Um, 
One of the major goals of the assignment position students had to use social media to develop professional collaborative networks, but the supportive and positive community that they developed among the students within the RJ hashtag went well beyond my expectations. The students really buoyed one another and shared resources in a way that I, I think I never could have planned for. Um, they also had really great experiences collaborating with professionals. A lot of the feedback that they got from folks they emailed was, I can't help you, I've got nothing, but that's an awesome project, keep going. Um, some people, however, stumbled upon really incredible information. Um, one author um, was the sister of the person who founded Popular Science, and so my student got in touch with their editors who were like, oh yeah, we have a ton of stuff for you. Um, so just all kinds of great feedback for them. And then a number of the students expressed the idea that until this project, they had felt like asking for help was a last resort, uh, perhaps because, because failure was an expected part of this project, or because collaboration was actively built into the project requirements, many students described a new outlook on the concept of asking for help. Um, so one of my students wrote um, that this project opened up a new side of research that I had never really explored. It's okay to reach out to authorities on a given subject and ask for help and be pointed in the right direction. I had struck a gold mine by reaching out to the museums and archives, and even when they had no physical resources for me, they had pointed me in the right direction. Um, so teaching students how to approach fellow scholars in a collaborative spirit as a valid form of research thus became one of the major unexpected outcomes of this project's focus. Um, and so I hope that this gives you um, some ideas, some thoughts, and I am happy to ask uh, some questions or discuss. I have a question. So I'm always interested when uh, we get students to use social media for an assignment. So was there any hesitation, people creating new accounts just for this, or people more familiar with other platforms getting a little confused? Could you talk to that angle of the assignment? Sure, they all think I'm nuts. They're like Twitter. Twitter's for stupid stuff. Um, so they, there's always that initial kind of like, what? Um, I do actually require all of the students to create a new Twitter account just for my class. Um, for two reasons. One is so that they can decide how publicly available they want their personal information, um, which puts me in line with the FERPA guidelines at Georgia Tech. Um, so if they don't want their full name in their Twitter account, they can make one. Um, they can make one that's like Georgia Tech student 457. Um, or they can make one that's like, who the heck knows who I am at Twitter.com. Um, and so that's good. And then second, it makes it a lot easier for me to grade if the only thing that is on that Twitter feed is their stuff. Um, when I first started tweeting, they were like, can I just use mine? I'm like, sure. But then I was having to wade through tweets about football games and stuff I really didn't want to know about my students and pictures <laughs> that I probably should not have been looking at. Um, and so now I require them to create one um, specifically for this. And then we do have a conversation in class about what a professional Twitter looks like, how you would go about building a Twitter following for a particular instance. Um, and I've had some of them that continue using this as they go forward into kind of professional careers because everything in it is research-based. Um, and so if they're going into marketing, if they're going into that, they can kind of build off of that. Um, and if you're interested, my the assignment sheet for Twitter that I use um, is on my website as well, so you can take a look. Any other questions? I'm happy to chat more, um, or you're welcome to tweet me as well because I'm on Twitter all the time. <laughs> um, thank you all. Okay. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, our next topic is going to be on trends in academic library maker spaces uh, by Ms. Thompson from Georgia Southern University. So my name is Delisha Thompson. I am the information analyst 
Learning Commons Supervisor at Georgia Southern University. And I came here today just so I can share with you some recent findings that I um, learned as I studied um, maker spaces in academic libraries. The purpose of the presentation is to share the findings of a recently conducted research project focused on discovering trends in academic library maker spaces. So what are maker spaces? Um, in short, they are places where people come together to make physical or digital, digital products and have shared learning experience. They share everything from equipment, raw materials, ideas, concepts, and even their spaces. It could be hobbyists, um, inventors, um, entrepreneurs, just you know, housewives. So they come together just to share and the level of expertise in each space varies based on what it's designed to do. And it's designed to come together for collaboration and to create communities of learning and teaching. So the purpose and objectives of the study was to go to certain websites and explore the technology, services, and operational practices that are available and in use in academic library maker spaces and to convert those findings into recommendations for any academic library, make, library that wants to in, implement one of these um, spaces, active learning spaces, into their facility. So I started off with two research questions just to focus on and address those two areas. What are the common technologies in academic library maker spaces? And what are the common operational practices in academic library maker spaces that um, people would need to think about as they move forward to implement one of these spaces in their facility. So, I started with somewhat of a breadcrumb trail, looking at information in the research about, um, from some articles where academic libraries had already implemented these spaces in their facility. And so I started like looking on websites and you know, within the literature I found some you know, articles that had the names of maker spaces and then it just kind of blossomed from there. So I identified approximately 25 uh, academic library maker spaces that had known spaces and then I created a list of those spaces that I would go and look at. I ended up eliminating approximately seven of those because they did not meet the criteria and I used the criteria of the Carnegie classification because I wanted to look at university library maker spaces, not necessarily um, community colleges or um, institutions that had an enrollment of less than 10,000. So when I went to the websites, as you can see a screenshot of my methodology, I created a spreadsheet for those 18 libraries and I had to go there twice. On the first pass, I was looking for specific indicators. So I had a list of 10 indicators that I was looking for when I went there, and you can see one through 10. Things like um, pertaining to their training, things pertaining to their staffing, um, and access, things like that. Then I went back again, took a look at the actual resources, technologies, and services that they offer those students in those uh, spaces. So after I gathered all this information together, I organized all this information by the four themes, four major descriptors. Information and training, written policies, staffing model, and access. So with the findings, um, I used Microsoft Excel to organize all the data and to identify what I was doing, and I used the content analysis, and this is a qualitative research study, so it's very basic. So what I found um, for the descriptor, descriptor of information and training is that 89% of the 18 survey library maker spaces have a mandatory training program, and 11% and do not require any type of training. But I have to note that the maker spaces that did not require training 
for those that offered 3D printing as a service rather than a do-it-yourself you know, um, experience. And so because they go in and they design their products and things like that, and then they turn it over or submit the order to a technology librarian, they don't have a hands-on experience. So they really don't need to be trained. But overwhelmingly, most of the libraries have mandatory training. But I'd like to break that down a little bit further, and there is some overlap in the data. The findings show that 67% of the libraries offer group training sessions. 67% offer technology-specific workshops. 28% hold one-on-one -on -one consultations. 11% hold classes, or they're in the form of classes. And 17% use video or online tutorials. So a given makerspace can have multiple ways in which they deliver training to their patrons. In the area of written policies, I found that 83% of the academic library makerspaces that were surveyed have a written usage policy, and that would be a general usage policy. 6% did not have a policy at all, and 11% of the sites that visited, it was just, the information was just not available. So either of these numbers could actually go up, um, so it's not to say that they didn't have a written policy, it was just not available for public consumption. But I will go and, and give you some additional information because breaking that, those numbers down further, it showed that in addition to the general usage policy, 44% required a signed user agreement, 17% require a signed waiver of liability. And finally, some of those spaces have lending policies where they actually lend out some of the equipment. 50% of those have a lending policy in addition to the general usage policy. In the fourth category, or the third category, I should say, um, staffing model. 76% of the library academic makerspaces that were surveyed, um, their library staff actually manages or governs the space. 6% is governed by faculty, and it really ended up being one library makerspace, and that was because of the unique model that it is. In that particular model, the um, students have to be enrolled in particular courses in order to have access to the major space. And in those spaces, the faculty actually teach those classes. And 18% did not have their staffing model information available. Um, going further, 44% um, of the major spaces are led by technology librarians. And sometimes those librarians were, had the title of an emerging technology librarian or an IT librarian. 28% use compensated or uncompensated student assistance. None of the libraries that we um, survey use or allow um, volunteers to help govern those spaces. In the fourth category of access, 83% of the surveyed libraries allow students, staff, and faculty to access the space and use the space. 17% only allow students, okay? Um, in terms of how they actually make reservations to come into the space, 31% um, use online reservation systems, 31% use manually, um, manual appointments through paper form or telephone, and 38% accept walk-ins. So coming down to the, the second category, which is the, um, the technologies. As you can see, the top three um, types of technologies up here is the 3D printing, electronics, and 3D scanning. They by, by far in all the literature that I read on the subject of academic library makerspaces, the high-end tech um, experience is what the college students are looking for. The next category is the you know, vinyl cutters, laser cutters, audio visual, and some of the textiles. 
as we get to some of the lower numbers, I think it has more to do with the fact that it's kind of difficult in an academic library in the space to have like woodworking, metalworking, unless you have the type of space and facility to incorporate that. Um, but surprisingly enough, down at the bottom, button making um, was one of the popular numbers in the lowest on the lowest end. Um, and that's probably because it's easier, it's easier to incorporate that into your, your program. So when I put all this information together to try to discover what the common trends are, it's discovered that for those academic library maker spaces, the librarians who run those and govern those, that they, for them who have decided that their spaces are successful, and what I can find from this research is that they have established user policies. Um, they require mandatory training, and is accessed by the university community. And one of the things that I found in the literature is that it's good to open the makerspaces up to the university community because well, oftentimes the staff and the faculty can bring in some of that untapped talent. They can come in and they can often run programs or events or even teach classes. And so, and, and also it helps with the liaison outreach program and the relationships across campus. And finally, managed by library staff. So um, I found that you know, most of these spaces are governed by at least one librarian and one staff member. Um, it's important that when a, a maker space is being established that you have dedicated staff so that people don't necessarily have to incorporate a new function into their existing job function. I found in the literature that people feel stressed when this is incorporated in. Sometimes the libraries don't have the budget to hire new staff, but um, you know, if, if they are able to train the existing staff and then absorb that in, then it works okay. But these were the common trends that I found in the study. So there are definitely challenges to establishing a maker space. Um, oftentimes when people talk about maker spaces, they think that they can just buy a couple of 3D printers and solders and cutters and just kind of put them somewhere. And then they find out that, you know, who's trained to work this equipment? Who's trained to um, teach and instruct the patrons that are going to be using the equipment? How will everything be paid for? You know, what are our policies concerning the community? or you know, um, access after hours and things like that. So there's a lot that needs to be um, addressed when implementing a library makerspace. Um, when I, as you can see the, the picture up here, as I was going through this, it was kind of a catch-22 in the air as far as should I put funding in the middle or sustainability? But because you know we can't do any of this without proper funding. But as we plan this, we have to plan it with sustainability in mind. You have to have the proper funding, not just to implement the space, but for ongoing, you know, for it to be an ongoing thing. Because if you're going to offer it as a service, you have to be able to ensure that it has a future. Um, have your policies together and have a stable staffing model. If some and if the university library wants to use students, you have to understand that students rotate. They graduate, they leave, they get better jobs. Um, and then we have to make sure that we have the space. Um, space is an issue for a lot of places because libraries are small. Some, some libraries are small. But in addition to that, um, there is a move towards getting rid of some of the stacks and some of the print materials. And so some, space, some spaces are being um, um, opened up for these, these innovations, but we have to make sure that we're able to address those. Cost considerations. So we always have upfront expenditures, they're the one-time expenses, but then there are those everyday expenses that may come up every day, every week, every month, such as salaries, um, materials, things like that that we have to think about. And when we put um, high-tech equipment in our spaces, how will that impact our utilities? So these are some of the things that we have to think about when we're going to implement an academic library maker space. 
So the recommendation for future studies in this area is, is um, assessment. Um, we know that these, these spaces are for creative expression and they're outside of like your, your um, chemistry labs and your STEM labs and things like that. Um, but if it's going to be a part of your academic library, you have to be able to assess it, um, to ask the question as to whether or not the space is being used. Is it being used as intended? What is the return on investment? I mean, what is its value? So there are a couple of ways that that, that can be done through utilization of statistics. Who's coming in, who's going out? Um, maybe picture satisfaction surveys. Just something that we as academic uh, librarians can go to administration or to our stakeholders, our, our friends at the library, and show that our, their dollars are being spent well on these spaces. So, you know, I recommend that for future studies because as I went through the literature, I just did not find a lot out there. There are a lot of community maker spaces. There, there are um, uh, public library maker spaces, but not as many academic library spaces maker spaces on whole. So in conclusion, um, and the recommendation would be to, if you're going to plan or anyone's going to plan to have an academic library maker space, to sit down and really come up with your user policies and make sure that those are written. Um, develop a strategy for disseminating the information and the user training, not just marketing the space, but um, disseminating training on the equipment. Think about training and hiring specific staff to manage the space. Think about hiring a technology librarian if you don't have one. Um, and consider allowing uh, the campus community to participate in the project and know the source of funding during the planning stage. Not to wait until you have something out there and say, oh, we don't have any more money. I mean, you have to close it down. So I'll skip the recap on that, but does anyone have any questions for me on our maker spaces? Uh, so in your research, did you find any academic maker spaces that were open to the general public and not just people enrolled in the university who are part of the university community? I I did. It was rather. It was a very small number. Um, I found that 11 percent of the surveyed library maker spaces are accessible to community patrons. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what I found in, in the literature is similar to what is happening at our library. That um, the funding for a lot of our tech comes from student tech fee and not necessarily from the library's operational budget. And when we get money from outside resources, they dictate to us who can have access to those, that equipment. So yes, 11% does allow community. Any more questions? Well, thank you. This is how you win the audience at uh, three thirty.
Alex Kevin, and this is Brett, and we're from NCC Libraries, and we're here to talk to you today about deep learning. Um, so, show of hands. Oh, that's not working. Okay, well, anyway, show of hands. Uh, how many people here have heard something about machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence in the news recently? All right, well, great. Um, so, you've, you've undoubtedly interacted with with things that use uh, artificial intelligence or deep learning. And so we're gonna talk to you today about what it is, uh, what it can be used for, how it, a little bit about how it works, and, uh, and we're gonna hopefully leave you with uh, and, you know, thinking about how it can be applied to, being, to the library, essentially, in the library field. Um, so let's set the stage, oh, well, okay. um, let's set the stage a little bit. So here are some things that uh, computers have traditionally been good at. Um, so things involving calculations, data storage and retrieval, display, automating things that used to take a while to do uh, manually, um, things that follow well-defined rules and structure. And so we've seen these things over and over again during the history of computing. These are things we've been able to do uh, on a computer now for a long time, and we can do them at a fairly large scale now. Um, so here are some things that computers have traditionally been worse at. Um, so pattern recognition, perception or knowing what something is, generalization, uh, and inference or making predictions. Um, so we have to explicitly tell a computer what something is or manually define precise steps to follow in order to achieve some goal. Um, so these are some er of the areas where deep learning is helping to improve the performance of computers. So we're gonna start off with a demo that maybe five to seven years ago would have been very hard to accomplish using traditional computing tools. And so to give some context, uh, SUMA is an application that we manage in our department for doing space analytics through the library. So generally the way this is done is that somebody walks through the library with an iPad and observes with their own eyes uh, what people are doing in our spaces. And so they manually capture the number of people by navigating the space and pressing a button for each of the, uh, each person they see. So essentially a head, a head count. Um, so this is a demo uh, to illustrate the power of the technology. So we'll leave ethical considerations aside for right now. Um, you know, we, yeah, you'll see why. Um, so what if we could capture images of the space and use that to count the number of people in the space? So we built this demo to show uh, we can do something like this pretty easily. And so you can see um, maybe that this count was captured in SUMA. Uh, the number at the, the end went up. Um, so you know, essentially, we, we fed it an image. Uh, and it recognized that we're, there were two people in the image and then it updated our, our headcount in our application. So let's formalize our understanding of machine learning a little bit more. Uh, first, machine learning is a field of computer science that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Essentially, it's an approach that enables computers to make predictions given some set of data. And there are two broad groupings of machine learning. Uh, the first is supervised learning, which is when we have an algorithm that learns how to make predictions based on pre-labeled data it has access to in advance. Examples of these are things like linear regressions, logistic regressions, and random forests. Most of the things you've heard about in the news or use every day are probably supervised learning in some way. For example, if we have an algorithm and we feed it labeled images of cats and dogs, we can train it to evaluate a previously unseen new image and classify it. The second broad category is unsupervised learning, which is trying to make sense of an unlabeled data set and then making predictions. An example of this might be classifying unlabeled textual data. This has been a less researched area because it's a much harder problem. So deep learning then is a subfield of machine learning that involves the use of deep artificial neural networks. These loosely mimic how the human brain works with layers of neurons and millions of connections between them. Deep learning algorithms are neural networks and they are a type of supervised learning. We train them with labeled data and then we make predictions on new unlabeled data. So deep learning versus traditional machine learning. Deep learning is generalizable and typically more powerful than traditional machine learning. In traditional machine learning, we have to manually define features which is time intensive and requires domain expertise. Deep learning algorithms, in contrast, learn features automatically. Neural networks don't need to know anything about the problem domain they're working in. In fact, they don't even know that they're operating on images, for example. 
All they see are matrices of numbers. The same deep learning algorithms can be used for different tasks. If I wanted to have an algorithm to tell me if an image is a cat or a dog, I could train that algorithm with new data and use it to decide if something is a horse. So what is deep learning good for anyway? First, one area is computer vision, which is what you've seen already. This is used in areas like image classification, object detection, self-driving cars, and medical imaging. Another area is the uh, natural language processing for things like translation and identifying concept similarities within texts. Uh, and your digital assistant examples also fall in here. They use deep learning as well. Deep learning has been around for longer than many realize and is rooted in decades of mathematics research based on models of how the human brain works. The ideas behind deep learning have been in development since the 1940s, but really only exploded in popularity in 2012, when a researcher used a deep learning model to achieve the state of the art by a significant margin in a computer vision research context, beating out traditional computer vision approaches for the first time. Why did deep learning take so long to take, uh, catch on then? Uh, well, really there are three broad reasons. First is that we had a lack of data. Only recently have we had sufficient volumes of data to really maximize the power of these deep learning algorithms. We also haven't had sufficient computing power. And now that we've learned that GPUs, graphical processing units, can be used for this sort of work, we've made great strides in what we're able to do technically there. And then a less influential reason is just there's been an explosion of research interest in this area. There are new algorithms and approaches. Um, so let's take a, a pretty high level overview of, of, of how deep neural networks work in general. Um, so the first point I want to make is that everything is numbers to a neural network. So we're making predictions on things like images and text, but first we need to represent these numerically. And computers already do this behind the scenes in a lot of cases. So for example, for a black and white image, uh, we can represent it as a matrix of numbers, where each number represents the intensity of a particular pixel, so how light or dark it is. Uh, for colored images, each number would be actually a set of three numbers uh, that represent the intensity of the red, green, and blue colors in a given pixel. Uh, and there are uh, similar approaches for text and other data. Um, so the general process that we'll have to go through to train a neural network is as follows. So first we define a prediction problem. So given something, can I predict something else? So example, given an image, can I predict whether it is of a cat or a dog? And then we need to gather training data. Um, so we need images of cats and dogs, and we need to, to tell them, like, to, to label them as a cat or a dog. And then, given this uh, labeled set of training data, um, tra we need to train a model that can make predictions given new unseen images. So here's what a standard neural network looks like. So they're organized as stacked layers of neurons with connections between them. And each of these connections has a numerical weight that represents how strong the connection is. And these are what we need to learn as part of the training process. So our in input image is fed to the network on the left, uh, which is called the input layer. Um, and the data flows through the neurons and connections in the middle, which is called the hidden layers. And uh, the prediction <coughs> of predictions made at the end, which is called the output layer. Um, earlier layers learn more abstract features like edges of the images. Um, well, later layers learn more specific features, so like in, in this case, maybe a nose or an ear or a tail, and then we make predictions based on those, those finer grained features. Um, so here you can see the network has predicted the image as a dog with 91% confidence. Um, here's a zoomed in view of a single neuron. So it, uh, what I want you to take away from this is responsible for applying the weights on the incoming connections, combining them, and then sending the value through an activation function. And all that is is something that just say, says whether the neuron fires or not, and how strong the, the how strong it fires. Um, and you can choose different different functions for that, but don't worry about any of that. Um, the signal is then passed on to the next neurons. Um, so to train the network, there's a few things that we need. Um, first, we need a loss function, uh, which is a function that just tells us how close our network's prediction is to the actual value that we know to be true based on the training set. And then we need a way to find values for all of the weights in the network so that this loss function consist, uh, consistently outputs good values for all of our training examples in the training set. Um, this would mean that our network is generating good predictions. So to do this, uh, we use a process called backpropagation, which uses uh, approaches from calculus to calculate the amount 
uh, and the direction we need to adjust the weights so that we'll be closer to the right prediction next time we run this example through the network. We update every weight, and we would re repeat this process multiple times over the entire training set. So this is called back propagation because we start these calculations at the end of the network and flow backwards to the beginning. <coughs> and uh, so now that our model's been trained on a large representative data set, it's very good at distinguishing between cats and dogs. So our model's ready to be put to production within an application that's feeding it your data. The process of getting predictions from your model on unseen data is called inference. But if you showed it a picture of a horse, it would be very confused since it's never seen a horse before. So it would likely report low confidence levels for both cat and dog. But if you needed the ability to recognize horses, you would just add a third node to the output layer and expand your training data set to include labeled pictures of horses and then retrain the model. So there's no need to write a manual like horse recognition algorithm or something like that integrated into your application. You can just retrain the network on your data. Um, so in our example, we showed you a, a vanilla neural network or a, a by its slightly cooler name, multi-layer perceptron. Um, but uh, we probably wouldn't use that to, to, do, uh, to do processing on images. So there are many types of neural networks suited for different purposes. Uh, and they all work similarly, but they use uh, different tricks to kind of operate on, on the type of data that they're, that they're good at operating on. So like convolutional neural networks are what we would probably use for image processing. Uh, the current neural networks are good for cat stuff. And we have a link up here that you can go see. There's just like tons of architectures that uh, a neural network can have. So now we all have a very shallow understanding of how uh, deep neural networks work. And we wanted to share an example of how we applied the R learning when we were getting started. And when we were thinking of a problem domain to solve, our natural inclination was to build a self-driving Mario Kart demo uh, using convolutional neural networks. Um, so why did we think this would be a good demo? Well, first we needed a way to collect data quickly. Uh, and as you'll see, this was an application we built to take screenshots while we were playing Mario Kart. So we're getting two for one. Um, second, we wanted a way to visualize the performance of the model as we collected different uh, volumes of data and different kinds of data. Uh, and we thought that this would be a pretty good way to do that. And the third reason, and probably most important, it seemed a lot better than putting Elliot's, uh, Kevin's three-year-old son, Elliot, on a self-driving tractor. So how do we do this? Um, as Kevin said, a model is trained using inputs. And we created a deep learning model that would create a self-driving Mario Kart. We then wrote a program that took a screenshot of the game every 0.2 seconds, while at the same time recording controller, uh, recording the controller input. So was the A button being pressed and what was the trajectory of the joystick? Predictions were made given new untrained screenshots. Screenshot. So when we were emulating the game and playing it through the AI, that is sending inputs into the game. Uh, we also wrote code to deliver these joysticks. This is an image of the model that we used, which was taken from an seminal paper by researchers at NVIDIA called End-to-End -end Learning for Self-Driving Cars. Uh, this model was developed as an example of how self-driving cars might work. It's not complete and certainly not what you would use to build your own self-driving car. It's much more complex than that. However, it's good enough to use for Mario Kart. And the point of this image isn't necessarily to understand the convolutional neural network there, but rather to understand the enormous number of connections it creates. And Troy can't read the caption. But this one model will create 27 million connections and will have over 250,000 parameters. This is just an inconceivably large set of data. Um, so the demo. Uh, this is an early example. This is using training data taking one lap around the track. So not a ton of data, maybe 100 screenshots. And you'll see that it really hasn't learned much yet. It can't turn, but it does know how to press A. This is a second example. Here you'll see that it can actually make a turn. Uh, this has been trained on three laps around the track. Um, you'll notice, though, that when it gets to strange structures like a tunnel, it, it fails. Um, so a few notes on how this is working before we proceed. What you're seeing here is the prediction part of machine learning. So we've already collected data, training the model, and now we're using that model to make predictions for new inputs. We're taking rapid screenshots of the game, passing the image, as, again, as multi-dimensional arrays of numbers to our model and getting a prediction, essentially controller input. And then we send that back into Mario Kart. 
Finally, the window on the right is a terminal showing how often those inputs are being set. So every line represents prediction. That's how quickly the prediction is being used. And finally, here's uh, a much improved model with about 15 minutes of play. So this is several thousand images. You can see it can perform much better. It can recover. It knows how to turn when there are green and blue checkers pretty well. Um, you know, this is like watching your kid walk for the first time. Or so I hear. <laughs> So a major part of our initial exploration in this area was to identify some of the opportunities in libraries. And we uh, found uh, three major categories. Um, so first is integrating deep learning into our own applications so that we can get some new functionality that we couldn't before. Um, so we've mostly been looking at automatic generation of metadata uh, and, or analyzing media like images, audio, or video so far. Um, so I'm going to show you a demo application that we developed to show how we could leverage deep learning to get a head start in metadata generation for newly digitized or created materials, uh, and how we can improve discovery without any human-generated metadata. And, and this is like an initial step. It's no replacement for, for the hard work that, that people do in, in uh, generating metadata. But um, it would be, it, you know, it's a, it's a good study. Um, so I don't know if, you know, if you're going to hear this or not, but I, I'll tell you what he's going to say. So we're looking at an oral history, a uh, little tale video that we do at the NCC libraries. And uh, I don't know if you can hear that. My greatest memories of how it's Whenever I brought people up here from Fairgrass, anyway. Um, so, so I'll just repeat kind of what he said. Uh, he said his, um, he was a, a physics major at NCSU, and he was eventually uh, a, a liberal arts major, and he ended up in liberal arts. And uh, he, he's talking about his memories of Harrelson Hall. And so, now let's look at this new, new catalog application, this prototype. So I'm gonna ingest this video and only give it a title and an author, um, fairly generic. Um, so when I upload the video in the background, the audio is extracted automatically and it's run through a speech-to-text deep learning model. Uh, and the full text is being indexed into solar. So remember what he was talking about? So we looked up Harrelson Hall, and the video shows up, and now we're gonna look up uh, physics, and it'll show up again. Um, and, if, and if we look up liberal arts, which he also mentioned, it's gonna show up. Um, so, so you can kind of see where I'm going with this. So I, we didn't give the, it any of this information, but it extracted it all from, from the video itself when we uploaded it. Um, so now that we have a textual transcription, imagine what else we can do. So we can, pro we can definitely provide it directly to users and automatically enable captioning on the video. Uh, we can do further analysis on the text and generate recommendations for appropriate subject headings or at least get the key terms or create a summary in an automatic, uh, automated way. Um, so here's another example. So this one uses the same model architecture as our uh, SumaVision demo at the beginning, but we took off the later layers of the model and retrained it on new data, data we collected, which is a technique called transfer learning. Um, so it's able to take advantage of, of the, how it was trained before, but we were able to generate predictions on our own kind of data that we gave it. Um, so this one finds the locations of headlines and images in newspapers. So uh, we can then run further processing to find out what's in an image, or we can OCR the headlines. Um, so that enables us to offer more fine-grained search results based on articles in the newspaper and the, the ability to jump to that specific article automatically since we know what page it's on uh, in the newspaper and we know where on the page it is. Um, the second opportunity for libraries uh, is supporting researchers through deep learning consultations and researchers, or research sprints. So we can help bootstrap researchers looking to get started with applying deep learning techniques to their research projects. So a faculty member at NCSU from the uh, Department of Marine, Earth, and Atmospheric Sciences, uh, Sciences contacted the libraries looking for machine learning support. So they have an extremely large data set of over one million snowflake images that were uh, captured by one of only 10 cameras that are doing this type of capture. Um, so they've used traditional uh, machine learning techniques to attempt to classify the degree of mining on snowflakes. That is how large or small the clusters of ice are. Um, we're working with them to develop a proof of concept model to explore the potential for current deep learning computer vision techniques to improve on their results. Um, so this has also been an opportunity to explore the viability of providing this kind of service to researchers. So is it useful to them uh, what kind of, or how can we scale this support? Um, the third opportunity area is developing an ecosystem around deep learning use, so things like data annotation and data distribution. Uh, in general, improving uh, the use of these approaches among cultural heritage institutions. So through our experimentation, we've learned that current tools for data annotation are extremely limited in terms of their ease of use and their speed of use. 
we prototype big designs for tools in this area that speed up the process and allow for crowdsourcing of the process. Um, as early adopters, we're also in a position to help define best practices and approaches for sharing models and data for reuse by other cultur cultural heritage institutions. So for example, if you uh, pursue a production model to detect headlines and images in newspapers, this would probably be useful to other libraries. How can we share the data uh, for the purposes of reuse? How can we make it easy for other institutions to get their own models up and running? How can we make it easy for them to create, uh, contribute new data to the model? So we wanted to close by saying a bit about algorithmic bias in deep learning. Uh, we hope we've convinced you through this presentation that the data used to train models is often where bias is introduced into deep learning. Uh, so we've been thinking about what are some concrete steps that we can take to reduce the potential bias of these systems and their impact on our users. Uh, first, we can create more representative data sets, which turns out is a non-trivial task. Um, we can also make it clear to users when we're using deep learning in our services. And then we can give them an option to provide feedback. How is it working for you? Where has it failed you? These are actually very valuable inputs because it helps us evaluate how successful our models are doing out in the wild. It's one thing to do it when you're sitting at your desk with the constrained data set. It's something totally different to do it in the wild. And then finally, uh, we could also look at ways where we could provide uh, users the opportunity to provide those inputs directly in the systems that would be a self-improvement mechanism through techniques like reinforcement learning. Uh, or we can give users the option to turn these services off if they're particularly disruptive or, or ineffective. But that's not to say that there aren't significant efforts being made in this space within the deep learning research communities. Um, there's a lot of work to be done yet in this space, but I thought it might be interesting to highlight for you all one thing that we found in our work uh, which is actually a publishing platform called Distill, which is supported in part by researchers at Google and elsewhere. And they recently published a, an interesting article called The Building Blocks of Interpretability that shows the progress some researchers have made in understanding the way neural networks recognize identifiable features in image data. And if you'll bear with me just for a moment, I'll slide this tab over into the main window of the thing. This is a really fascinating paper. It's also a very fascinating publishing platform, uh, just generally to consider as we move toward the future of scholarly public publishing. Um, and what they've managed to do here is to develop uh, a paper that shows the ways in which these models look at features as they're being trained, and it's interactive. So you can see here that when the model is being trained on dogs, it's looking at floppy ears and saying, oh, floppy ears are important to me recognizing what and then you can see, um, well, I'm looking at um, pointy ears, and that's helping me to recognize what might contribute to a cat. Of course, you know what the challenge is. There are dogs that have pointy ears, and cats that have floppy ears. Um, encourage you to check this paper out. It's, it's a very dense read, very technical, but the uh, visualizations, I think, are helping to show the state of the art in terms of the thinking, uh, pulling back some of the, the black boxes from deep learning. Thanks very much. Really appreciate your time. specialized in researching snowflakes, much less that there are 10 cameras in the world that can photograph said snowflakes. So that's fascinating to me. But that aside, um, I know that there are several folks here who, like me, work with audiovisual materials, work with text materials, particularly in digitization. Can you walk us through a little bit more slowly about the automatic generation of transcripts for those oral histories, because I think that there are several of us who would be fascinated to hear how that works for the deep learning stuff. Yeah, um, so actually, uh, we, this talk was uh, originally like 60 minutes long, we condensed it to 20, and we talked a little bit more about how we achieve each, each of the things we were showing, and, uh, and so we use a, a variety of different approaches for each one. Uh, so some we, we use existing models that we use uh, data sets that already exist. Some we use models uh, that we get that um, have data sets, but we, we take off a lot of layers and we train it on our own data. And um, this one in particular, um, we actually just send it out to an API, uh, the Google uh, speech, cloud speech API, um, which, you know, it, it's free for small amounts of text, but when, or small amounts of uh, audio, but when you 
uh, send in longer amounts of audio and start charging you. Um, so that's that's how we're achieving that particular one. Uh, we had work, uh, th there are a couple of uh, models that you can run on your own uh, hardware available for doing speech to text. Uh, Mozilla uh, recently released one called Deep Speech, I think, and we tried that out, but uh, it turns out that like the, the results we were getting from that one were not comparable to doing something like Google Speech API. I mean, and, and we decided that um, since speech to text is a very uh, generic problem, um, rather than something like you know newspaper uh, or headline identification, um, so it's a generic problem, so uh, Google can probably do it better than us. Um, so yeah, it's using the Google Speech API. Okay. And I mean, it, it, it takes the video and it extracts the audio using FFmpeg, uh, and, then, and then it sends the audio. Uh, 